So Allah is saying, those who disbelieved, whether they belong to the people of the book, or they were from the mushrikun of the Arabs, they are going to be in the fire of hell. And why so? Because they are the worst of all existence. They are the worst, worst of all existence. Why? What would make them the worst of all existence? It is because Allah had given them al-bayyinah. Allah gave them no, such a proof from which you cannot counter. You have no justification for leaving it. And they still left in their kufr. Even after the clearest light, clearest proof came to them, after Rasulullah min Allah yatlu suhufa mutahara came to them, they still wanted to end up in kufr. Nobody could be worse than these people. So these are sharrul bariya. On the other hand, in ladina amanu wa amilu salihat, without a doubt, those who believed, where is iman? Inside, wa amilu salihat, and acted righteously. Where is that? On the outside. First the inside, then the outside. Isn't that in the previous discussion too? There was ikhlas first, and then iqamu salai ta'zika. Same concept again. So now, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ By the way, inna in the beginning of the ayah. Sometimes Allah says inna, sometimes He doesn't. Inna is a good indication of the audience. Inna in Arabic is used, of course, harf at tawkid It's used when the audience at hand is in some confusion. They're not sure. They're not sure. So they have to be given certainty. So, you know, Allah speaks with the audience in mind. You know, and you get a good insight into the audience by the kind of language Allah uses. So the audience here is those who needs to hear, this is for sure going to happen. This is not some, you know, uh, some casual thing. Get the doubts out of your head. Izalat al shak. Get it out of your minds. This for sure will happen. These are the worst of people. They will be in hellfire. These are the best of people. Ula'ika hum khayrul bariyya. Those are the best of all existence. Jaza'uhum inda rabbihim. Their pay, their reward, with their Lord, with their master. From the beginning of the ayah, we already learned the slave of Allah does not expect to get paid ex- until with Allah. Okay? They don't expect pay here, they expect it with Allah Azza wa Jal. They know already, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اشْتَرَى مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ بِأَنَّ لَهُمْ الْجَنَّةِ The reward isn't here, the pay isn't here, the pay is there. And they're happy with that. They're happy with getting paid there. They'd rather not just enjoy it a little here and then nothing there. They'd rather get it all there. So their expectations, this tawakkul, one of the conditions of slavery that Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah mentioned, that's being applied here. أُولَٰئِكَ جَزَاؤُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ جَنَّاتُ عَدْنٍ تَجْرِي The gardens of Adn, one of the higher places in paradise. تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ At the foots of which rivers are flowing. This, even this description comes so many times in the Qur'an, right? تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ Jannat, All the time in the Qur'an. But we don't stop and think about it. We don't stop and reflect. What is Allah offering us? You know, to this day, I've traveled so much of the United States, and I've seen the same thing. The richest households, the most expensive houses, the most prime real estate, guess what? A swimming pool, a nice lawn, gardens and water, beachfront properties, riverfront properties. It's, an, it's a human obsession. Oh man, a house like that. When you go on vacation, where do you go? You go somewhere that has a lot of nature, a lot of jannat, and you'd really love to go somewhere where there's a waterfall, or there's a river flowing, or there's an ocean. The water is an obsession. People go to vacation to go see water. People go see Niagara Falls, water falling. Right? It's an obsession in the human mind. Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us things. You know, I, I bring this up because some intellectuals who think they're intellectuals claim the Qur'an you know, gives, motivates people towards things that are primitive. It was talking to a bunch of desert people. Of course, he told them about gardens and water because that's what they didn't have, right? They didn't have gardens and they didn't have water. So it's just talking to these primitive Arabs. It's not really talking to the sophisticated philosophical mind because we would require something higher. You know, if they're that sophisticated, then how come even in the most modern of times, our obsessions are still garden and water? To this day. (laughs) To this day. Subhanallah. So Allah gives us, He's offering us what we wanted all along. You know, and, and as you get older, I've noticed this, as people get older, they really get into gardening. Right? They, they love taking care of their garden. There's this thing of uh, older maturity to enjoy, you know, nice nature, to take a walk in a park and enjoy the garden and, you know, serene environment around you. And this is, this is a desire that builds inside people, no matter what culture, what religion. Allah knows who He created. And He offers them this, but He can't have it yet, you gotta wait. Right? Jannatun tajri min tahtiha al-anhar. 
This time he says, خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا They will remain in it permanently. أَبَدًا without end, permanently. The word أَبَدًا was not used for hellfire. But it is used for Jannah. This has led to some confusion with some people. Two places in the Qur'an this happens. That for Jannah we get أَبَدًا and for Nar we don't get أَبَدًا. This is one of those places. The other place is Surah Al-Taghabun, Surah number 64. There are very few scholars in our history that had a certain Shad opinion. It's only fair to mention it because it includes heavyweights like Ibn Taymiyyah himself, rahimahullah, who actually believed that the hellfire will eventually come to an end. And eventually it won't be there anymore. Jannah is permanent, but Nar is not permanent. This is a very rare opinion. This is not the majority opinion, of course. But it does exist. So it's only honest to mention that that opinion did exist. What was that opinion based on? It was based on these two citations in which Allah mentions Abadan with, with, with uh, Jannah, but doesn't mention it with Nar. So this is a very rare opinion, but it does exist. How did the majority of scholars understand it though? First of all, in the entire Qur'an, has Abadan been used for hellfire too? Yes. Abadan has been used for hellfire also. But from a rhetorical point of view, the purpose, the way, the, the style of speech is something else. It's telling us something else. You see, in the Qur'an, sometimes Allah is, explains hellfire more and paradise less. Sometimes He explains paradise more and hellfire less. There's different proportions. When there are equal proportions, they both get abadam. Or they neither get abadam, they're equal. When one is given more information than the other, then the wording is more elaborate than the other. This is the case here. If you look at the first ayah, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمَا خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ شَرُّ الْبَرِّيَا One ayah for the people of hellfire. If you look at the, the, the seventh and the eighth ayah of the surah, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِّيَا One ayah. جَزَاؤُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ جَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا جَنَّاتُ عَدْرٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا رَضِيَ اللَّهُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُ And then Abadah is in there too. Much more detail given to the people of paradise. When more detail is given to one group, more wording is used for that group. This is part of the style of the Qur'an. Okay? So that's, that's the justification of Abadah here. Nonetheless, we acknowledge that that, that, that opinion does exist. Anyhow, now we're up to the part, خَالِدِينَ fiha abada. They will remain in it permanently. Again, something that speaks to human nature. Why does it speak to human nature? We want nothing more than permanent residence. Right? And so, I'm not talking about immigration, but that, that's included. Right? Or, you know, citizenship. Or, you don't want to rent. What do you want to do? You want to own. You don't want to just own, you want to pay it off. So generations from now, it's in your family. It's not just yours, it's for your, yours for generations. There's this desire to want to have what's called stability. You want stability. You don't want to be... If you're a young man or a woman, or you know, especially young men, they have a good job, they're living in an apartment, salary is good. What are your parents always telling you? Buy a house, buy a house, buy a house. Settle down. They're telling you to settle down. Allah says here, you can settle down. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا abada. It can remain in it permanently. And this is amazing housing because there are no bills, there's no maintenance, there's no plumbing, there's no electrical problems, right? There's no HOA dues, nothing. خَالِدِينَ fiha abada Without any of the strings attached. And this is, this is Allah's gift to us. And you know when you compare it, whatever Allah has to offer in Jannah, when you compare it to whatever you have in dunya, you will see how the dunya fails. How it fails. The most beautiful home. It gets dirty, right? It has to be maintained. It starts falling apart. It starts getting boring. It starts, cracks start showing up. Things happen. But those homes, خَالِدِينَ fiha abada. The most expensive house, you were living in it, financial troubles came, you couldn't pay property tax, now the government steps in. Right? Something's always there. It's never totally yours. It's never totally yours. But Allah is saying, this is totally yours. What an incredible motivation Allah gives. So it's the, the essence of the deen in the one ayah, and the essential motivation. I'm giving you a house. The essential motivation in the other ayah, which is at the, at the heart of every human being's desire. At the heart of every human being's desire, there's a, there's a desire for a nice house. Every one of us has it. It's pre-programmed. We can't even fight it. And those of you that are younger, don't think who have it. I'll talk to you in a couple of years. Same, it, it, if it's not there before, it kicks in later. But it kicks in. And you can't even help yourself. 
So Allah Azza wa Jal speaks to our nature. Then He says, the ultimate gift. This was the small gift by the way. The ayah is gonna get bigger, the bigger gift is coming. رَضِيَ Allahu anhum. Allah will be satisfied with them. Allah will be pleased with them. This is, the, this is Allah's promise to those who simply did what? لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَى وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُ الزَّكَاةَ One ayah, basically a transformational ayah, you fulfill that, Allah is happy with you. The master is happy with the slave. رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ And unlike any other slave, وَرَضُوا عَنْهُ And they will be completely satisfied and pleased with him too. Rida in Arabic means to be pleased with someone to the point where you have no complaints. You have no issues left. Everything, you're totally happy with them, you wouldn't want it any other way. There's no room for improvement. I wish you did this too. No, it's com- Allah is completely happy with them. And they are completely happy with Allah. Your kids even are never completely happy with you. Even when you buy them stuff. Right? There's always something more you could have bought for them. Your wife is never completely happy with you. Your husband is never completely happy with you. Your parents are definitely never completely happy with you. Right? But this Allah, Allah will be completely happy. It's, it's an incredible gift. This gift makes you forget about the house and the jannah and the gardens because Allah, you know, He built it up. You're thinking about this nice house. Let me tell you about even a bigger gift. And then imagine the way Allah will be gift you, you will be so happy, no other thought will come in your mind. Even the most wealthy person, when they get the, everything they want, there's always something empty. Man, what, I, want, I want something more. I'm bored. They're completely satisfied with him. And then at the end of this surah is something that ties to the beginning and we conclude. ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ خَشْيَ رَبَّهُ That is for the one who truly feared. خَشْيَ خَشْيَ is in Arabic, the fear of something greater than yourself. That's what khashiya is, different from khawf. Khashiya is the fear of something greater than yourself. That is for the one who truly feared his master. Khashiya rabbahu. The one he worships and the one he is a slave to. The surah began with a discussion of how the world was fragmented. Munfakin. They were not going, the world was not going to be brought, you know, these lines were not going to be drawn until al bayyina came. We started in the beginning talking about how when this revelation came, this revelation that came down in the night of power, how powerful the revelation itself was that the world was divided into the people of La ilaha illallah and everybody else. The world was divided. But who were these people who truly feared their master? We said this in the beginning, I'll just reiterate it and I'm done. The, you know the word munfakina in the first ayah? لَمْ يَكُنِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ مُنْفَكِّينَ حَتَّى تَأْتِيَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَةِ Infikak in Arabic, infakka al-azam, like I said, when, the, when, your, when your bone is in the place in your shoulder, and it's dislocated, that's called infakka al-azam. The, the bone is dislocated because of weakness. It's a painful dislocation. This is the image given of people who said La ilaha illallah and disconnected themselves from their ways of kufr and shirk before Islam. It wasn't easy because their families were doing and their society was doing the same thing for thousands of years sometimes. Hundreds of thousands of years. Their citizenship, their respect, their dignity depended on their religious identity and they walked away. They dislocated themselves from their religious identity when Bayina came, when this true, true, completely undeniable proof came. This is because they did not fear what's gonna happen in that society. They did not fear that they were gonna get ridiculed. Whether they were Muslims from Persia, whether they were Muslims from India later on in Islamic history, or the Sahaba themselves in the Prophet's life. They didn't fear when they disconnect themselves from the society of kufr, what will happen? Because who did they fear more? If they didn't fear the society, who were they fearing that they did that? ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ خَشِيَ رَبَّهُ So it's connected with what came in the beginning. That infikak would never have happened. That separation would never have happened unless by a people who truly, truly feared their master. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us of those who fear their master.